Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 136. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And it's been a while since you've seen us, but we've recently returned from Denmark, having done a series of interviews there, which we're super keen to share with you in the near future. But today's program, however, has a Canadian theme. So our feature interview is with the Canadian textile artist, Kurt Dunn, who's also known as the Knitting Pilgrim. And we have a mini interview with the Canadian yarn dyers, Jamie and Christopher from Cabin Boy Knits. So Kurt Dunn is an actor, a knitter, and a textile artist based in Toronto. And during the summer months, he was touring Austria and Germany with his one person play called The Knitting Pilgrim. And the play recounts Kirk's 15-year artistic journey of hand-knitting three huge panels, which look like massive stained glass windows. And the pictures in these knitted stained glass windows explore the connection between the three Abrahamic faiths, which are Judaism, Christianity and Islam. So in August, Madeleine and I travelled down to Nuremberg here in Germany to see the play, The Knitting Pilgrim, and also to interview Kirk Dunn. And I get really excited to see knitting being used as a medium to make stunning and beautiful art. And these knitted stained glass windows are incredibly beautiful, impressive and touching to look at. So I'm totally thrilled with this interview for several reasons. But one little reason is that Kirk being an actor means he's an excellent communicator and he was a total breeze to interview. So I'm really confident you're going to enjoy meeting him and you'll love seeing his knitted art. Yes, and last year on Prince Edward Island when we were there, that's Canada, um, I did a mini interview with Jamie and Christopher from Cabin Boy Knits. And they own this 17 acre property with a pre-confederation log cabin in Ontario. Their property is in a forest and they use natural ingredients from this forest to hand dye their yarns. They use a mixture of European and indigenous dyeing methods to create their own recipes. So that's a fun interview to watch. And on top of that, mum and I have lots of knitting projects to show you. So we're gonna start with me in under construction. I've been working on a pair of socks by Charlotte Stone, who we interviewed in our last episode, number 135. I've finished my first coffee sock, and now I am working on the second one. This is actually my first time knitting socks, and I decided to jump into the deep end by starting with Stranded Colorwork. And the pattern is from Charlotte's book, Charming Colorwork Socks. Now, before starting this project, since this is my first time knitting socks, we, um, I wanted to learn as much as possible about how to knit socks. So we ordered this book called Custom Socks Knit to Fit Your Feet by Kate Atherley. And I actually interviewed Kate Atherley back in episode 51. That's right. Yeah. And Kate has a background in programming and mathematics, so she's used to creating products that might be complicated behind the scenes but have to be easy to use for the end consumer. And she uses those same skills in her work as a tech editor and knitwear designer. So that's a fun interview to watch and I encourage you to go back there if you haven't seen it already. One of the things Kate talks about in the book is how to swatch and test your gauge for socks. So socks are knitted in the round, which means generally your gauge is tighter than if you were to knit them flat because you don't have to purl every second row. And that's why Kate advises you to also swatch in the round with a swatch circumference of 15 centimeters. Now, knitters are only human, and <laughs> humans can be lazy, so we like to find shortcuts wherever possible. And she does know this, so Kate also offers a shortcut where you actually only knit the swatch flat. And with this method, the swatch only has to be 7.5 centimeters wide. With the shortcut, you only knit on the right side of the fabric. This means that at the end of each row, you bring your working yarn across the wrong side of the fabric and start the next row with the first stitch of your previous row. It's similar to knitting an I-cord, except you don't pull the yarn tightly, you keep it fairly loose. And to keep the edges neat, I knit the first and last two stitches through the back loop. When I was doing the colour work section, I held both the dark and the light yarn together for the first and the last two stitches. Kate's book has lots of helpful advice like this. 
That's a really good hint because I've done this kind of swatching many times before where you're only knitting on the right side of the fabric and then you bring your yarn around the back and then you knit again on the right side of the fabric. So it's a really good hint to knit the first two and the last two stitches of the row through the back loop and also to hold both yarns together because mm -hmm. that does give it a really stable edge. Otherwise what I used to find is that the first two and the last two stitches just get sloppier and sloppier and then it's harder to knit to measure the swatch. So that's really cool. So what Madeline has done here is just cut the, the um, loops at the back yep. so it's flat. That's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very happy with that shortcut. Uh, so what swatching method did I end up using? Well, this was my first pair of socks so I was extra nervous about getting everything right and I decided to swatch in the round because of that. And then I realized that knitting the actual sock would only add an extra five centimeters in circumference. So then I thought, why don't I just start knitting the actual socks? Um, that's what I did. But when I had finished the color work section, I did put it on a pair of cable needles and tried it on and it fit really well, but I hadn't blocked it yet. At the time I was still in Sweden and it was the day after Sophia Capel's wedding. So I had all these great knitters around me. And designers. Yes. And I asked them for advice on whether I should block my sock or not before continuing. And the general message was that it should be okay. So I decided to be naughty and just keep knitting um, without blocking my sock. But then at the end, when I finished the sock, I did block it and I tried it on. And luckily it still fits me really beautiful. It didn't get looser. Yeah. If yep. you've knitted it well, it's not likely to, actually. Yeah. Well, okay. another another one of the chapters that I read was about reinforcing your socks. So this is still Kate's book. And uh, you might want to do that with sections that experience more friction when they're worn. So that's mainly the heel. But you can also reinforce smaller sections like individual toes in case your toes tend to poke through your socks. And I think typically that would be the big toe. I didn't do that, um, and Charlotte's pattern already includes an eye of partridge heel flap, yeah. so yeah. that's all I did. You can also use reinforcement yarn, which is a thin yarn or thread that you hold together with your sock yarn, and it typically contains nylon, so that can be helpful if your sock yarn is just pure wool. And um, the yarn that I'm using is Socklandia Socks Yarn by Giggling Gecko Yarns. Judy is the hand dye behind Giggling Gecko Yarns. She puts 20% nylon in this, so I didn't need any reinforcement yarn. And Judy is based in Switzerland. These two colors are called Banty Brown and Double Fudge, and they're the recommended yarns for this design. And they're really gorgeous. Yes. I think but they're perfect for this design. You yeah. might have noticed though, I did use a different background color for the coffee cup section, and that's because I wanted the coffee cups to just pop out even more. And I'm already used to mum always making changes to patterns. And then when I was in Sweden, I had all these knitters and designers around me that are always making things up and changing things around. So that just encouraged me to be a bit more adventurous <laughs> with my own, my own knitting. When I was up to the coffee cup section, I was sitting on the couch knitting with Sophia. And I told her that I wanted to change the background color. So Sophia suggested that I use one of her leftover cream colored yarns instead. You can see the original socks on the left and my sock is on the right. At first I wasn't sure if the contrast would be too strong, but I gave it a go and I'm absolutely thrilled with how it turned out. I also knitted the steam in the lighter variegated yarn, uh, double fudge, instead of the dark chocolate. And I think it's a little more see-through and steamy this way, so I really love it. I think that was a really great suggestion of Sophia's to use the cream behind the coffee cups. It really makes them stand out. And I really yeah. love the speckledy yarn being used for the steam. It does look really kind of transparent. So well done. They Thank look you. great. I love it too. One more thing. Uh, the cast on that I used was a twisted German cast on. I think, it, oh no, cast on. No. Twisted German cast on. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> also known as the old Norwegian cast on and it's stretchy so that's why I chose it because that's brilliant for socks you need to fit your big heel through the opening that's why you want the opening to be stretchy and um, you also want it to be tight when you pull it back on um, anyway so uh, I really think the pattern is written very well and I had a lot of fun playing around with the colors and now I just need to finish my second sock 
And then I'm going to buy some shoes so I can show off the colour wax section. That's extravagant, buying shoes to match your socks. <laughs> it is a little bit, but I'm thinking that maybe I'll knit some more colour wax socks and then I'll have one pair of shoes for all of those socks. Okay, so you've, got, you've been bitten by the bug, the yes. sock bug. <laughs> okay, so we're um, in Bring and Brag now because in the last episode... I was working on the Hortensia beaded lace shawl, which I was knitting as a wedding gift for my dear friend Sophia. Sophia is a Swedish knitwear designer and she also has a charming YouTube channel called Sophia's Tales. And in August, as Madeline has already mentioned, she married the love of her life in a beautiful little Swedish wooden Baroque church in the countryside, incredibly romantic. And Madeline and I were thrilled to be invited to the wedding. So Sophia wore my lace beaded shawl together with her pale blue wedding dress and she looked radiantly beautiful. And as Madeline has also mentioned, some other knitted designer friends of ours were also attending the wedding, so it was really fun to catch up with them as well. You know, our job is just so unusual that now I've found that many of my <laughs> best friends are living in other countries, which is very sad on one hand, but it's just such a thrill when we actually meet in person and not just virtually all the time. Anyway, so I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to get any close-up footage of um, Sophia wearing her shawl during the wedding. So before we travelled up to Sweden, we decided to film a little fashion shoot of Madeline wearing the shawl, and that way you get to see the fine details of the finished pattern. Now, I believe that knitting should be recognised and appreciated as an art form, so that's why we've chosen to film the shawl alongside some 18th century masterpieces. And the whole fashion shoot is accompanied with a masterpiece by the German composer Schubert called Auf dem Wasser zu singen, which means to sing on the water. So the shawl is in excellent company and we really hope you enjoy our little fashion shoot. Oh, 
So we're back and under construction and I've started a new project and once again it's a Kim Hargraves design. <laughs> I did really try to find a sweater from a different designer that would also work with this yarn here but what I found was never quite the style that I was looking for. So I convinced her, it was actually my fault, because <laughs> yeah. we've got a huge collection of Kim Hargraves books now and I was pretty sure that it, within the books you'd find exactly what you want. And in the end, you found something in this one, didn't you? I did. I looked at the covered book and there's a design called Gladden and that's what I'm knitting now. So the Gladden is knitted in pieces from the bottom up and it has set in sleeves. The front and back are covered with a really pretty lace pattern resembling wheat shafts and they're also decorated with bubbles. The recommended yarns are the Rowan Alpaca Classic and the Kid Silk Haze. So they're two beautiful yarns which you hold together and together they produce a soft and drapey fabric. I'm not using the recommended yarn because I have this lovely yarn here from Cabin Boy Knits. It's called PEI, so Prince Edward Island Earthen Roots and it was especially made for the Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival last year. It's dyed naturally with madder to give it this earthy red tone and that resembles Prince Edward Island's red soil. Famous red soil. <laughs> yes, famous red soil because <laughs> I think the iron ore makes it red. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's a DK weight yarn and it's 75% mass, no, blue face Leicester and 25% massum. And I'm combining it with this really beautiful, fluffy, brushed fla uh, lace weight yarn from the company Mohair by Canar. And it's a really luxurious blend from. 72% uh, kid mohair and 28% mulberry silk. The colour just has a number, 3024, but I think it's really pretty and it's a perfect match for my Cabin Boy Knits yarn. When knitting these two yarns together, my gauge also perfectly matches the recommended gauge, which is brilliant. So far I've only knitted the back piece. Well, I'm not quite finished yet, but I'm nearly there. It's looking really good. Yeah. It's got some, a lot of bubbles. They're actually quite perky <laughs> and sticking out. Yeah. <laughs> So here's a close-up of the back piece. It starts with a 2x2 two two rib and then goes straight into the lace pattern. The lace is really simple and easy to unpick, so I'm not using a lifeline this time. The only mistake I made was on the pearl rows of the lace. I had to purl two together, but did this through the front loop instead of the back loop, and that means that some of my stitches are leaning to the right, even though they're supposed to lean to the left. I realised my mistake about 20 rows too late and because it's not too obvious I decided not to rip it back. You can see the mistake if you look really closely, it's in this section here, but only if you look really closely so I think it's going to be fine. Yeah I think so too and the fibres do tend to blend so it's not very obvious. Yeah with the halo of the, of the silk mohair it yeah. hides it. Yeah I do agree with you the bubbles are quite perky so I'm going to steam them flat at the end. Do you know I wouldn't be surprised if for the photo shoot for this book that they also steamed it flat because you've used the same technique and theirs are significantly flatter than you so than yours so I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good I'm glad solution. they're significantly flatter than me. <laughs> okay it's quite hard. <laughs> um, anyway so I still love this design and I've been really enjoying working with the yarn. I think it's really pretty with the halo effect and I'm not used to working with mohair. Uh, yeah, so that's my Gladden jumper. Keep going. And now we're up to our interview with Jamie and Christopher, the yarn dyes behind Cabin Boy Knits. And in the interview they talk about how early European settlers who went over to Canada brought with them uh, different natural dyeing and dyeing uh, plants 
like madder and weld, but also mordants like alum, tin and chrome. And these mordants were more effective at binding the natural dyes to the fabric than the tannins that the indigenous people were using at the time. So the two groups started trading with each other and exchanging their knowledge and they even sometimes formed unions through marriage. And from these marital unions of predominantly French Canadian settlers and indigenous groups, a new ethnic group emerged called the Métis. And Métis or Métis is French for person of mixed parentage. So interestingly, Jamie's ancestry is part Métis as well. So Jamie was able to trace his ancestry back to the Northwest Company in the 1690s. And I think that's where French Canadian settlers were working together with indigenous people in the fur trade. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So that's yeah. an interesting fact about Jamie. And Jamie and Christopher plan to create a sustainable, eco-friendly tourism program on their 17-acre forest property. And to do that, they've received one of five grants from their local government for experiential tourism, which sounds very interesting. So they're planning to take the participants of the program into their gardens and into their forest to forage for natural ingredients and they'll teach the participants Canadian and Indigenous dyeing techniques. And then afterwards, the participants will prepare their own dye pots and dye their own materials, which all sounds like a lot of fun. And Jamie and Christopher have also recently finished a project with Concordia University researching how people decide what wool fibres to use. And the aim of that project essentially was to learn how to encourage people to buy and use more environmentally friendly fibres. So as you can see, the cabin boys are particularly passionate about their work, particularly when it's in connection with protecting the environment. And Cabin Boy Knits are kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount of all their hand-dyed yarns and kits from their online store. And Cabin Boy Knits commits to a choice of best practices for a sustainable environment and responsible production from beginning to end product. And as you'll soon see in their interview, they produce some really stunning colours from their natural dyeing ingredients. So thank you so much to Jamie and Christopher for this great discount. So I'm with Christopher and Jamie from Cabin Boy Knits. They have a dye studio in a pre-confederation log cabin out in the middle of the woods in Stirling, Ontario. So you're using a combination of early indigenous and European natural dye practices. That sounds really interesting. So could you tell us something about that and then show us what you're offering here at your booth? Absolutely. I'd love to. We use, as you say, the not only the recipes from our ancestors, but also we incorporate some of our own as well. And when we look at the ancestors and what they brought over to North America, primarily they brought over madder, weld, and woad. And we use some of those. And we use some more as well. We've got marigold here which we grow in our own garden okay. and we have oak galls we live in an oak forest and so we've got oak galls everywhere so it's it's absolutely fantastic as a mordant to bind the color to the yarn and with the oak trees we also use the leaves and the acorns as well and the bark and that gives a fantastic color and then we have cochineal cochineal is is fantastic they're bugs and the cochineal really gives a vibrant red to some of our yarns and then lastly, we go back to some words, and this is the pit of an avocado. And the pit of an avocado is amazing okay. because it really works so well as, as a mordant to help bind the, the color to the yarn. So we've got, you know, we've got a lot of, lot of available to us. We forage in our forest. Uh, we've got 17 acres and there's just so much in our forest that can give us great colors. And one of them that's out right now is goldenrod. And goldenrod's absolutely amazing. And it really makes... Uh, yellows pop 
And when you think about the color of yellow and, and popping, if yellow is not your color, well, green might be your color. So when you add indigo to the, to the um, goldenrod, it really looks fantastic. And so that's some of the European influence, but there's also the indigenous influence as well. And that's where Jamie comes in. Jamie's indigenous, and he brings a great perspective to our dine. I am a Métis, first, which is one of the categories of First Nations. Mm -hmm. My ancestry, I could date back to uh, 1690, French-Canadian with a bit of Scottish. And um, it goes back to the Northwest Company because this, one of the Scotsmen with Native, um, they worked together and they worked um, in the fur trade but together with the natives. So they incorporated a lot of their similarities and, and their practices were incorporated. And so some of the practices that we use, um, they would have used way back when. So for example, we have um, sumac on our property and as Christopher mentioned, oak. These are two samples of the uses of oak and sumac on both of these. This as um, a mordant, the sumac would have created this uh, olive green, and yet on here, it would have just been a brown. And there's also a reddish to it. Mm -hmm. Some of the recipes, for example, um, the Micmacs, the Micmacs, the Algonquin, the Ojibwe, um, some of the French Canadians used the same practices that they learned from the natives right up until the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But with the European influence, um, they discovered, which was already here, things like bloodroot and wild plum, which he used with these mordants to create other colors with the blend. But what the influence especially are some of the mordants that the Europeans would have brought over. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was one of the game changers. When you look at mordants that are used, really it's how to help bind the color to the yarn. Because if you're not using a mordant, you'll take your yarn out and you'll say, wow, that color is great, but it'll be gone so quickly. And so the mordants such as alum and chrome and tin and copper were brought over from Europe. Some of them we don't use anymore because they're toxic. And so we only use, we use alum and we'll use some of the ones I mentioned earlier, the oak galls and whatnot for, for our yarn dyeing. Well, that's great. Um, you also like to educate your customers on the qualities of fleeces from different sheep breeds. So I was hoping you could show us some of your more unusual bases. Yeah, absolutely. And I, when you mention that, I get a big smile on my face because I love the different breeds because they bring so many different qualities to your yarn. And so the first one I want to show you is just our Massam and Blue Faced Lester. And it, it's really the combination of the two really looks nice because it brings almost a tweed effect when you when you look at the, the dyeing. And then we have um, one of our Wensleydale. So this is one of the new ones that we've been dyeing. And you can see that this is an indigo dye. So when we look at our Wensleydale and we look at our Blue Face Lester, this is using indigo. So they're both using the same thing, but they're different bases. And so that's why we're getting different color from them. But the Wensleydale has a long staple and it's the sheen on it is absolutely stunning. So it makes me look good. So that's why I love dyeing with, with Wensleydale. And then we've got a couple of others. We've got our um, Blue Face Lester. Blue Face Lester is also another great um, yarn to dye with. And this one, you know, this is one of our signature yarns. We have we have multiple dye pots going, and the color looks really vibrant. And so, um, you know, it, it's I. I I have to po focus or uh, point to the to the sheep as the ones that, who are the main contributors on this, so they help us look good on the, in this. But this is you know one of the one of my favorites. And we like to mention with that as well as you know when you talk about perhaps three color bases that we use that are natural, and you could with that BFL you end up with maybe a dozen to fifteen different variations of colors with the overlaps with just three basic, very natural basic dyes. Mm -hmm. The last one I wanted to mention is just Shetland, because when you talk about Shetland, you think about, you know, a color, but there's actually 11 colors. And so when you're dyeing over Shetland, you get various colors using the same, using the same dye bath. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's lovely. So that's definitely one of my favorites as well. And when we talk about, you mentioned educating people, and I always do a history on the sheep. So all of those that he's already mentioned, I, I, you know, a 20 minute on each sheep and their, where they come from. And what a lot of people don't know about the sheep where we like to educate, because all of these blends do have a merino base, but people are always looking for softest. But we source a lot of rare breeds. These are mostly rare breeds, but the softness and the luster to them, it's not just the merino world. There's a whole world of sheep out there. Absolutely. So you have so many beautiful colors here. Is there something you're particularly excited about showing customers? Maybe a new release? Thank you. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. We have Blueface Lester and Massam, and this was dyed with madder. And when you think about madder, madder was one of the main plants that was brought over from Europe to North America. And so we were 
tinkering around with the coloring, and we think that this looks very similar to the soil that is in Prince Edward Island. And I also want to mention that, you know, we are on Prince Edward Island, and the British would use the matter root historically and still do to uh, dye as the British redcoats. So that we thought was very interesting and it connects to the island. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you. We we more than enjoyed it. And thank you for being here. <laughs> well, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Each of our episodes is about 90 minutes long, and we put an enormous amount of thought and effort into every minute of these episodes. Where typical feedback we get from our interview guests is that they had no idea how much time goes into preparing and then filming an interview, and these feature interviews only make up a third of an episode. We do believe the end result is worth it, so we're really happy to invest our time and energy. Uh, and many of our viewers will message us or leave comments beneath the videos that they love the show and they're binge watching all the episodes and that's brilliant. We're thrilled to hear that people love watching the show and that they learn a lot from the program because that's what we want to achieve with Fruity Knitting. But we also want to remind you that the most substantial way you can show that you value our work is by becoming a Fruity Knitting patron because in the end without financial support we can't continue to produce new episodes. Our Patreon memberships start at five US dollars a month, which most of our viewers can afford. And so we just ask you to please keep messaging us and leaving comments beneath the videos because we love reading them, but please also become a Fruity Knitting patron so we can continue producing Fruity Knitting. Yes, thank you very much. And we have a Fruity Knitting live event for our Shetland level patrons coming up on October the 29th. So the guest for this event is Charlotte Stone, who's a sock designer and author of the Charming Colourwork Socks. And we interviewed her on episode 135, which was our last episode. So Charlotte is English, but she lives in Switzerland and she specialises in stranded colourwork socks. Her designs are really quirky and colourful and incredibly popular. And it's her goal to produce a sock design to suit every personality out there, whether the design has a nature or a hobby or a food related theme. So we organize these live events for our Shetland patrons once a month. Our Shetland patrons can attend the event live and our Merino level patrons can listen to an edited version of the event as an audio podcast. Now, as Madeline said, although the primary reason to become a patron is to support the show so that we can keep producing new episodes, we do try to give you some extra benefits like access to these monthly live events and some patron discounts as a thank you. So we're back in under construction with my newest project. So knitting a strand of silk mohair together with a strand of a regular wool yarn has been a really popular concept for quite a few years now. But I'm very late to the table with this concept because I'm doing it for the very first time with my newest project. Actually, both Madeline and I are doing it for the first time with our current project. Yeah. And it's a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I had thought in the past that um, knitting because silk mohair is quite sticky, knitting it with another yarn it might make the yarns tangle up together or if you need to rip back, which I often do, it's going to be harder to rip back. And also having two strands of yarn together ups the expense of a garment. So there's some of the negative reasons why I haven't done it before. But I'm actually really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun and it does create a really beautiful texture to the design. Now I'm also a little bit embarrassed to tell you that I'm also knitting another Kim Hargraves design. Actually, it's a mashup of two of her designs because by combining two of her designs together, I will have exactly what I'm looking for in my next sweater. Here are the two designs that I'm combining together. The one on the left is called Charge and the one on the right is called Parker. And both of them knit up to the same gauge of 22 stitches and 30 rows to 10 centimetres. And they both use the same recommended yarn, which is the Rowan Alpaca Soft DK. 
So it all started because I was trying to find a design that would work really well with this yarn here. This is the Devonia 4-ply in the colour Moon Bloom and it's by John Arben Textiles and it's a totally stunning yarn. It's a blend of Wensleydale, Blue Faced Leicester and Exmoor Blue Faced Leicester fleeces and they're all long wool so they have a sort of a shiny finish to them. And it's it's not just a matte blue, It's it's got a heathered it's, it's a heathered yarn because it's dyed in the fleece and that means that before the fleece is spun it's dyed so the majority and you can make a really good recipe by doing that because the majority of the fleece will be blue but then you can add little flecks of um, say pink or purple or even gold fleeces in it and you mix it up to a certain recipe and then you spin it and then you get this beautiful heathered blue yarn so predominantly it's blue but you've got specks of other colors in it so it is really a stunning yarn i just noticed it's matching your nail polish is it yeah, yeah good <laughs> <laughs> so it is a four ply weight yarn but it's slightly on the thin side of four ply so i like to create a really firm fabric when i'm knitting for a few reasons. Firstly, your stitches look way neater and your garment can last longer so you won't get these saggy baggy elbows or a sort of a, a saggy uneven hemming on the, on the garment mm. and it can also help to prevent peeling. So there's some of the reasons why I like to create a firmer fabric. So if I was to knit this slightly on the thin side four ply yarn with a design that's using a typical four ply gauge then most likely my fabric that I'd be creating would be too loose and a little bit too sloppy for my liking and it would mean that I would have to go and adjust all of the stitch counts which as you know I do in almost every design but sometimes I just get a bit sick of it. As I said I'm really late to the table but eventually I realized that if I paired it together with a silk mohair yarn I would get the very typical DK weight gauge of 22 stitches and 30 rows to 10 centimeters square and that That's would very just clever yes, <laughs> and that would open up a whole range of designs for me to choose from so I played around pairing this with different shades of blue from lighter to darker and actually it was your decision mm. you decided that and and she's right so we went for this combination <laughs> I like here, to which, hear that <laughs> <laughs> which is a lot darker blue so this silk mohair is really significantly darker than the moon bloom but when knitted together, the end result looks like a stonewashed denim fabric, which I totally love. I'm really in love with how it looks. Now, going back to the designs, I thought the stitch pattern on charge, which is the design on the left, wouldn't show up well in a dark color and you, because you wouldn't be able to see all the small patterning, particularly because the mohair would also give the fabric an extra fuzzy halo but I really loved the dimensions of this sweater because the bust measurement for size small was much closer to what I wanted at a 92 centimeter circumference. Whereas the bust measurements for Parker in the small size, which is the design on the right, was 103 centimeters and this would be way too bulky for me. But the cable design on Parker would really stand out with good definition even if I used the silk mohair yarn. But then again, I preferred the waistband on Charge better than the waistband on Parker. So that's why I decided in the end just to do a mashup of both designs and take what I think is the best of both designs and put them together. So I, if we have a look here on the hem part, I started off with the stitch count of Charge for the hem and I knitted it exactly according to the pattern. So we start off with some rows of garter stitch down here and you do that on a three millimeter needle, which is really tiny for a DK weight yarn. And that just creates a really firm, elegant garter stitch because if garter stitch is too loose, I don't think it's an attractive stitch unless it's gonna be on a baby blanket. After that, if you pull it on your side, I don't know if you can see that, but you do a row of little holes. And then you continue up with a two by two ribbing and you decrease again down to a three millimeter needle and do another set of garter stitch um, rows on the top. And that just produces this really firm, elegant waistband that's gonna sit sort of snug and neat in your waist, which I totally love. After that, I had to figure out how to reduce the stitch count of Parker into the dimensions of charge. <laughs> So if you take a closer look at the design, you'll notice that there are five horseshoe cables in the middle 
and two smaller cables on each side. And between these cables, there are sections of reverse docking stitch. So if you look closely, you'll see that these reverse docking stitch panels gradually become wider towards the top on both sides of the garment. This shape is intentional because the design includes drop shoulders but a tighter fit around the waist. You can easily adjust the number of stitches in the reverse docking stitch panels without changing the overall appearance of the design. So that's how I reduce the stitch count of Parker to fit into the dimensions of charge. Mum, you're a regular Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Except for a monster, I think you're creating a beauty. I really hope I do create a beauty. I think I so. I think it'll work. So I finished the, this is the back, and I finished the front. So that's the main part of the knitting done and I'm working on a sleeve now so I'm pretty sure I will finish all of it for you and hopefully be wearing it in the next episode. That'd be good. So now it's time for us to say goodbye. The beautiful stained glass windows, knitted stained glass windows that you're about to see are really inspiring and Kirk's use of colour actually reminds me of impressionistic pointillism because it creates this luminous effect that makes it appear as if light is shining on and also through the knitting. So I think you're really going to love it and you'll really enjoy the interview. It's very impressive. So thank you for spending time with us and we'll see you again in October. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Madeline and I have travelled down to Nuremberg here in Germany to interview our guest Kirk Dunn. Kirk is a Canadian actor, knitter and artist. He's based in Toronto and currently he's touring and captivating audiences with his play The Knitting Pilgrim. So right now we're sitting on stage in the Presse Club, which is in Nuremberg, and that's where Kirk's going to be performing later tonight. And behind us, you can see three amazing knitted stained glass windows. And through his storytelling, Kirk takes the audience on his personal journey of creating these magnificent windows, which explore the commonalities and differences between the three Abrahamic faiths, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Yes. So it is really exciting to be here with you. So thank you so much for inviting us down here and sharing your work on Fruity Knitting. You're very welcome, and thank you. I, I love being here. It's a thrill. Thank Good. you. So let's first hear just a little bit about your background and your journey as a knitter and artist. Mm, sure. Okay, well, um, originally I, I came from um, three generations of Presbyterian ministers. I was the one who broke the trend. I became an actor. And uh, in theater school, actually in, in acting, there's just a lot of time on your hands. So it turned out to be perfect for knitting. And I had a girlfriend when I was a young actor who had just knit me a, a sweater. And so I figured the big 
surprise for Christmas was to knit her a sweater. And because there's so much time sitting around backstage or on set, I had time to do that. And that was fantastic. And then, unfortunately, <laughs> as is the curse, we know, <laughs> lost the girlfriend, but I kept the knitting. And uh, then I married my wife, Claire, who encouraged me to keep knitting. And she actually encouraged me to introduce myself to Kay Facet. And I apprenticed with Kafe, and he had a huge uh, impact on me just around color because I, I loved color. It was the big thing I got into knitting for. And um, Clara encouraged me to experiment too with, with, my, with my knitting. So in addition to um, the sweaters, I was looking to try something else because Clara invited, she introduced me to um, Natalie Nage, who was the executive director of the Canadian Textile Museum. And Natalie said, you know, sweaters are great, but what you really want to do is an installation, like some serious art. So I was trying to figure out what's that going to be. And I was doing um, a performance in a church uh, in Toronto, and I looked at the stained glass windows and I thought, wow, those are beautiful. The colors are fantastic. I would love to knit something like that. And that was the spark that got me to think about, well, how could I knit stained glass windows? And I came up with this idea about the relationship between the uh, Abrahamic faith, so Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And uh, I embarked upon that. And while that was happening, I was also still experimenting with things like how to make knitting interesting and, and surprising. And I was knitting these, these small little sculptures of, uh, and they were mostly marine life, things like a puffer fish or a lionfish, and they were totally knit, lots of color, and people really found that to be engaging and, uh, and a really surprising way to use knitting. Okay, so when you got this idea to do the three stained glass windows based mm -hmm. on the three Abrahamic faiths, that's interesting because you've come from a long line of, of ministers and you often emphasise how your spiritual beliefs influence your art. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to elaborate on that a little bit more and also <laughs> tell us about two or three people perhaps who have really profoundly impacted you as a knitter and an artist. Right, absolutely. Well, I think I think all of us tend to use knitting as a, a spiritual practice, even though we might never call it that. But when you think about it, it's, it's very contemplative. You you sit and you knit and you, and thoughts go through your head, and that is it can it can be like a prayer or it just can be like a meditation. So mm. it works on that. It's also for me uh, creation. Where I've heard people talk about it being uh, like sorcery. Or magic. You, yeah. you take a little string and you turn it into a, a sweater. Uh, how did that happen? It, and it, you, know, uh, you can also use the word like it's a miracle. It's it's a, it, you are creating something. So it's very spiritual in in that way. And um, yeah, and, and I was really influenced in, in that spirituality too, and in, 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 in theology by my father, who was a minister, and his theology was very inclusive, very open. Um, so he uh, taught me to respect other faiths and to uh, allow them to happen and, and not to be threatened by anything and have my own views and look for other views. And, and so this project really helped me with that, really helped me expand my, my points of view. So, and just very quickly, you knitted him a jumper, didn't you, with, designed with crosses all over it? I did. And actually, that ironically, that was the, the, the piece I was working on when I met Kaif. And I showed that to Kaif and it had so many colors in it. In fact, my father's favorite color is orange. And so the complementary color to orange is blue. So I said, I'm going to knit a sweater with orange and blue. But I also like to use all kinds of different colors. And so when I was doing the orange, I used anything from yellow to red. And then with the blues, anything from green to purple. And I've had people look at that color and say, wow, for a color that's all orange and blue, it has very little orange or blue in it. Pure, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a, it, that's kind of the, the way, it's the way Kafe uses color, and I think that's what he found so appealing, and why he, um, he agreed to have me as, a, as an apprentice back in 1998, I think that was. And I had a fabulous time with Kafe, who was inspiring, and he was so, and is so prolific. He lets, doesn't let anything get in his way. He's always doing something. Mm. If it's not knitting, it's uh, needlework, or if it's not needlework, it's quilting, or painting, or mosaic, but he's always doing something and it's it was just so invigorating and inspiring to to be there with him so how long were you there with him and what kind of methods or or techniques did he really impress upon you did you take on his techniques yeah I think I, I was there for about a month uh, back in I think it was the month of May and I just was trying to pick up as much as possible so I think the knitting technique itself um, it, 
just his, his his ability to choose color and the way he approached the colors uh, in that that fearlessness that was the thing that I I really uh, embraced and the way he took that not just to knitting but to everything he again like he had me doing some mosaic work with him and and I think I, I don't think I did any painting but he, oh he he was designing the Chelsea Garden Show mm. and he brought that to the Chelsea to gardening and so that was a big oh aha yes color is everywhere and I need to I need to look for it and notice it and and use it so that was I think the, the big thing from Kaif. Yeah and actually um, when I interviewed him if we if we get back to the topic of spirituality mm -hmm. and if we had to describe Kaif as having a spirituality it would be something along the lines that everything is connected through color. <laughs> yes absolutely yeah, yeah yeah and that idea and so the, the same is I think it, true for me I think that everything is, is connected to and we have so much more in common than we have that separates us that one of the whole reasons I think that I am doing this show and one of the reasons I, I like to, to knit and do art is to bring people together and of course knitting is a, is a fantastic allegory for that you're knitting things together you're bring, you're incorporating them you're working them together and I think that may be why it really speaks to me on that level. And you also mentioned that Karen Armstrong, the teachings of Karen Armstrong were very important to you, yes. showing how lots of traditions were interrelated and connected. Yeah. Did that also influence your picking out of the images in the in the three panels at all? Yeah, absolutely. I, I find Karen to be uh, fascinating because she, she's a brilliant scholar and she started out as a, a Christian nun and yet she is, I think, um, for a lot of the uh, Muslims I spoke to, they always referred to her as somebody who really understood their faith. Um, and she's able to you know, look at all the faiths and not just Judaism, Christianity and Islam, but all all of them and and find those common threads and uh, yeah that really helped me think about okay well what are the images that I that I can use that speak to us or that people will recognize or um, and how can I use those images to ask questions that I think uh, a lot of people have or certainly that I have that I think are prevalent a lot in in, in the Western society that that I, I live in. This was also spurred on, this whole project was spurred on after 9-11, is that mm. correct? That's, yeah, that's, that's correct, because I was looking at um, these faiths and looking at 9-11 was a huge part of that too. Like, what is it about them that means they can't get along because they have so much, they're basically all saying, my understanding, the same thing. And what is it that has gone awry that makes us think that we're all completely different? Because, in fact, we are so much the same. Okay, so then together with your wife, Claire, who is a playwright, mm -hmm. you wrote a one-person play, The Knitting Pilgrim, yes. which you'll be performing in just a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So how did three knitted stained glass windows turn into a touring play? Ah, <laughs> well, I, in order to, to do this project, I had to apply to a grant an Arts Council grant so I could fund it. And um, I told them I was going to get it done in about 10 months. Uh, and it turned out to take me about 15 years. So <laughs> after 15 years, I had one project. It was a big project and it was an impressive project, but it was just the one. And um, so I only, I didn't really have any formal art training. Uh, I wasn't represented by a gallery and I didn't have any other exhibitions under my belt. So what that meant that in the art world, uh, nobody really paid attention to me because I had no reputation. I, I had no body of work to fall back on. Uh, and so as we tried to get this work placed, it, we couldn't really get any traction. And so we decided to go to the problem for the solution. And if um, no, one, no one would come to see it, uh, we would take it to them. So we wrote this play about that experience of coming up with the idea, uh, the challenge of starting it, and then the Oh, the, the strange and twisted um, path of it taking 15 years and what that does to your life and your brain and your marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, ironically, the people who see the show, um, they a lot of them say, you know, I, I may not be a knitter, uh, but and I know that your show is about knitting, but for me, it wasn't really about knitting. It was about that path you took and about you sticking with something for 15 years. And it reminded me of me and my doctorate thesis, or it reminded me of me and the 
the renovation I was doing or the art I'm doing or or the, there's always something in someone's life that they can relate to my journey yeah. and that's where that I think the show connects with everybody and it is a real pilgrimage isn't it which it, it absolutely is and the you know it, 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 when you look up a pilgrimage it's it, it is it is not a straight line it is a wandering meandering path and it's it's about it could be a religious experience or it could be the the path of an artist but it is a a challenging enlightening and uh and a, a journey that's important in and of itself rather yeah. than about where you started and where you got to it's about all that twisted path in between like knitting <laughs> exactly Very <laughs> okay much. so can you um just for our audience go through the play just pretty quickly but and sort of describe how the play moves along and because it's very interactive isn't it and you even teach people to knit absolutely in a basic way so maybe just go through and yeah and well it's i uh <laughs> i'm a strange actor in, in that i don't often like to take and talk about myself and so um that I, is very strange it is <laughs> it is uh and so I invite people to, to knit with me. And, and I think this is one of the things about knitting is it's something you do with your hands. And we know that when we're doing something with our hands, we, we tend to open up. Mm -hmm. we, we often have really good conversations when we're doing something else. Uh, and so that's kind of what the knitting does. And I, I bring along some yarn and some needles and I invite people to grab some and knit. Or they can bring some from home and, and knit with me. And then we, we start with a very, very brief knitting lesson, which we return to throughout the show. And I talk about where I came from and, and um, I talk about my history as an actor and as a, as a, a PK or a preacher's kid. <laughs> Uh, and then I talk about this idea of being challenged to come up with something that is not just sweaters or, or jumpers. Like, how can I use knitting in a way that might be like an elevated form of art? Authentically art, yes. yeah. Authentically Recognized art. art. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so I do that, and then it gets me in all kinds of trouble because I've bitten off way more than I can chew. <laughs> also with this very difficult, problematic topic. Yes. So I need to be, I'm also terrified because I don't want to insult anybody. I don't want to offend anyone. And I, I thought I knew a little bit about these faiths. And of course, as with so many things, we think we know a lot. And then when you actually look into it, it turns out we know nothing. Nothing. <laughs> And that was very embarrassing. And um, I, I made a fool of myself a number of times. And so I talk about that struggle of addressing each faith and and stepping in it. And the and blunders that you make oh, accidentally. Just the crazy the crazy blunders. And yet the, the people with whom I in interacted were all very open and wanted to help. And um, of course, the problems and the fear was all in my mind. It wasn't out there. Nobody was judging me. Uh, and that's something, I think, uh, a huge thing. And I think that's something that, that we as, as knitters often uh, worry about is we think, oh, I'm, I'm not a very good knitter. I, I'm not really doing this very well. Or this person is so much better than I am or all that kind of stuff. Well, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and nobody nobody really cares. The important thing is that you're, you're doing it. And and it's it's the doing of it that creates something that is tangible and uh, wonderful and something you can point to and it's an accomplishment. And that's very much what this this play is. I think it's reminding us all that, that we can do that and that our lives, although we find them to be very disappointing every now and then, are, or we think we're not getting to the places where we need to be. In fact, um, we are. And, and everybody else can see that. And sometimes we can't. And that's very much what this, uh, this show is about. And afterwards, you invite the audience to come up on the stage and even touch the tapestries and have a really close look and, and continue the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, and that's for a, a couple of things. One is I want them to see a, the, what the images look like um, from, you know, from five, ten feet away, and then also see what they look up, like really up close. Because I'm using multiple strands of yarn to, to mix the colors. Yeah. I'm sometimes using uh, five or maybe as many as seven strands of yarn in the same group of stitches. And it's the, it's the choice of those different colored yarns and the way they twist as you knit them that, that give a movement to the color of the piece. Um, and I also, you know, it, it's kind of like color mixing, but without paints with yarn instead. Yeah. So, you know, and, you, and we all know how to mix green paint. You take 
blue paint and yellow paint and you mix it up and, and the, the blue and the yellow disappear and then you get green. But with the knitting, you can take some blue yarn and yellow yarn and you use them together and they stay and they also still look like green. Yes. So it's this wonderful thing that um, I think is surprising for people, people to see when they get up close to it. And I also like to throw in a little bit of um, the complementary colors too. So in the green sections, I throw in a little strand of red in there and then again it would twist and come in and out and disappear and what it does is really gives that green a pop it really makes it um, stand out and i've had people say um you know it looks like you're actually pushing light through this or you're shining light through these these windows but they're not they're completely opaque they're but it's that it's that playing with the multiple strands of color that make it look like there's a play of light on them and that it brings life to them and very much like the pointillistic exactly. or impressionistic effect yeah yeah, yeah that, uh, that that's something that comes from you know people like Georges Seurat the the pointillists that was the way they painted with little little specks of color and then as you step away you can see you can, again it's a bit, a bit like the magic and the creation the miracle yeah. of uh, of knitting and of, of color that something looks different up close than it does far away. Yeah, so and it's I, very beneficial for them to come up and actually see that. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm glad you started talking about the technique because I really do want you to describe your creative process, including the, the real crafty techniques that you used. And mm -hmm. then after we've done that a bit more, I thought maybe you could just um, go through the three panels and pick out elements or motives and talk about... Just tell us more about them, what their meaning is or why you put them where they are. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. It was uh, quite an interesting process. I had to start first by figuring out, okay, well, what am I going to knit and how is this going to look? And so I thought, well, um, I should use the dominant symbol of each faith. So for the Christianity, that would be the cross. And for Judaism, that's the Star of David. And then there's the... Uh, for Islam, there's the crescent, moon, and, and the star. And then I figured, well, I'll put some the, the positive images of the faith inside that particular shape for each faith. And then outside that shape will be um, the more challenging issues. Uh, so, and uh, I, I didn't know, I, I was terrified about how, how to start. And so I figured I'd start with what I'm, I feel safest with. But, so because I'm a Christian, I started with Christianity. And I, um, I thought I'd also start as a, as a stained glass artist would start. And what they would do, if they're doing a stained glass window, they do something called a cartoon. And that is a full size, so one-to-one -one scale, sketch of the window. So I had this huge piece of paper, which I had to glue up the middle, and I did a pencil drawing of this window. And then I, because I wanted to use color, I used some pastels because I could, I could kind of smudge them and get some, uh, some variation with my, my thumb. So that's the way I did it. And then I had this cartoon and I took a photograph of that and then I, I scanned it into the, um, the knitting program I used, which is called Stitch Painter. And that was able to graph it so that I could knit from it. Now, <laughs> just quickly, yep. what, how long did that process take? Because oh, that's a lot of work already. Yeah, it, it, months. Because I also I had to I had to decide what image was going into each section. So the cross itself divided the paper up into a bunch of sections. So I had to put an image in each one of them, and I had to think about okay, I've got how many like, positive images in the cross and then the challenging images outside the cross and what are those going to be decide on those sketch them make sure they fit in those places and then put the whole thing together and then color that all in and then take a photograph of that so that's that's what i did it took uh, well it took a year it took a year to, to design the whole the whole thing so i uh, i took the photograph and i scanned it into that program but then it all came out as a big blur and so I had to spend a lot of time and I cho chose each individual stitch, each individual color to sharpen up those images. And then I printed up the pattern a little section at a time and then I would knit that section. And um, I would hope that I kept my <laughs> gauge right so that the, the sections all fit together. Did and you start off with a gauge in mind? I, I, I didn't. I didn't really measure it, I, I think. <laughs> 
What I did was <laughs> I a typical knitter. <laughs> yeah, a typical knitter. I, I said, well, here's how many here's how many yarns I'm going to use at once, uh -huh. and that was my gauge. Mm -hmm. And how big it was, I didn't care about because I was I, I just wanted to make sure that everything fit together. Yeah. And and the 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 gauge was quite well. It was it was quite large because I was using as many as five. Um, Threads thread, together. Threads at, at once. And I was using five millimeter needles. So that's that's the way I did it. And then a couple of times I forgot to, to check my gauge and I fell in love with certain yarns. You know, mm -hmm. you fell in love with really, I, there were some chenille yarns that I just loved. And so I used them a lot, but they were really, really thick. And I did half a section. So a piece about this big, it was like that big. And I realized, wait a minute. I don't think this is going to fit. And I measured it against the other section I'd finished, and sure enough, it was waste time. So I had to, it was, you know, there was no point in ripping it out because it was, it was just wrong all the way through. <laughs> but and it was beautiful in its own. It was beautiful on its own. Yeah. So I still have it somewhere. But it's, yeah, just sitting there. And as far as ripping out goes, every now and then I'd have to rip out because it was very, I had very um, labor intensive knitting. You really have to pay attention to every every stitch because I'm knitting, you know, four stitches of blue and then one of black and then three stitches of yellow. And then, and, and I'm also on the fly choosing what those blues and, and yellows are. They, I have um, an idea of, of what to go from, from the pattern, but I'd make it up on the fly. So for my blue, I'd choose, okay, uh, that light blue and that navy blue and that royal blue and, and a, a green. Yeah. And yeah, and this, and I use that. And, and then uh, for the next time I came around a blue, I'd have to choose a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and uh, so that, it took a long time. Now, the benefit was I didn't have any repetitive motion uh, problems because I was knitting for a very little time before I had to stop, look at the pattern, and pick up again or stop and, and look for yarns. Yeah. So it was very stop and go, very, yeah. very labor intensive. But um, yeah. And that's... did your technique change at all through? Because it's a long time that you were knitting yeah. and you went through three panels. Yeah, it did. Uh, when I started, I would just choose a color and I'd use that length of color until it ran out. Uh, and, and, it, it resulted in a, a kind of stripy look because you'd see little blocks of, of color and where they would change. And as I um, moved forward in, in the later uh, panels, I didn't like that look so much. And what I'd do is I'd, I'd um, have about three or four different color combinations that I'd use at the same time. And I mean, I'd knit two of one and then one of the other and three of another and, and move back and forth. And I ended up working on just developing a technique. I, I, and I've been told that it's strange because other people have looked at me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm knitting. And they said, well, eh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, where I'm using both hands, yes. where I'm knitting with, I'm knitting yeah, yeah. with both hands. And I'm always twisting the yarns because there can't be any holes. Yes. So I, I've developed the ability to do that. Um, and I, I do it without, without thinking. So, um, yeah. That's so you'd just be it. carrying colors behind and then pulling them in to use them yeah. when you felt you needed them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, entirely. So the back of it looks like a rat's nest. Mm -hmm. It just didn't make any sense at all. The front of it, and, and with all knitting, you, you really only care about the two stitches you're knitting, or the, the stitches you're knitting with now, and the one coming up. Yeah, and, and everything else is like a you doesn't know, matter. You, you yeah, forget about that. But yeah, that was um, very much my technique. And the other thing, one of the things I learned from Kafe was um, get out of the way. Like don't worry so much about the colors mm. just look at what you've got and then go for it mm. let the colors do the work for you don't try to micromanage everything yeah and and it's a bit scary to do it and sometimes it doesn't work to begin with and then suddenly you become quite good at it or rather you're not there anymore so you're just letting the colors do their work it's it's again it's that that, that meditative kind of, kind of yeah. yeah and that miracle of creation like yeah. you're just getting out of the way and letting things happen and that's that's very much a, a, a huge thing that i think kaif does very well he just sees colors and can intuitively know what works together and that's a really hard thing to communicate to people. Yes. Um, and he, he does it very well. And he it's also, not analytical. You can't yeah. analyze it. You have to get That's that right. part of your brain away and then just let it sort of yeah. come out of your subconscious yeah. in a way. Exactly. <laughs> and then you see what happens. And mm. sometimes it works and sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. And he, he would, <laughs> he would um, admit that himself. Mm. He'd say, you know, Meh, this, is, this one didn't work, so let's not bother with it. But as far as the ripping out goes, yeah, that, um, sometimes I'd make a mistake and I'd have to go, ah, uh, I'm going to have to report those two rows. Or sometimes I'd see the mistake like five rows down. I'd say, I'm not 
ripping out those five rows. And I'd be able to just pick out, just just drop the stitches there, work down, fix yes. it, and work back up. Yes. And I learned to do that, and I, I couldn't even tell you how I do it, yeah. but I learned to do that just because I really did not want to rip out yeah. those five now, rows. Now, I want to quickly, because I know that the viewers are going to think this or ask this, they want to know what kind of yarns did you use? Uh, I think you started off quite... Um, Puralistic. <laughs> yes, I was very Puritan about it. Yeah. I wanted to just use, I said, I am only going to use natural fibers. So it's only going to be um, wool or cotton or silk or linen, none of these synthetic things. And then I got to the, um, because it's stained glass and there are joins in between the glass panels, uh, those are metallic and they're called, in English, they call them canes. Um, so the black wasn't doing it. The black just looked like a like an absence of color. And I thought, oh, that's not going to work. And so I found in Paris, <laughs> I found this huge cone of a metallic yarn. I said, oh, that's I got to use that. And so that went into the, so each came um, each black session is three strands of um, of wool of um, worsted weight wool and then one strand of this metallic um, yarn, and it would do the twist, and it looks like it's there. It looks like it's metal, and then I thought, well, the metal works really well. And then I found a copper yarn of spun copper that really made some of these brownish points really jump. I thought that's nice, and then I just said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll use anything if the color's nice, if it's good. That's what I care about. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it's what it's made of. So pretty much, it started out very. Very um, natural, and then it just the doors exploded. Off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I would really love you to um, give us a closer look at the panels. Maybe pick out some of the elements, and yeah, talk about how you put the design together. Now, I would love that. This is the Judaic tapestry, and uh, so of course the the main symbol of Judaism is the Star of David. So you can see the Star of David in, uh, in inside the the window, and I, I did want to have a little bit of. Um, I guess I didn't want it to be straight on. I wanted it to be look a, a little more interesting than that. And so you can see that it's, there's, there's some angles uh, to it here. And it makes for some interesting shapes to fill as well. Uh, this shape right here, you can see the, the Dove of Peace. And there's actually a, a similar image in all three of the tapestries because the peace is essential to all three faiths. And, and I think in some ways, it's the reason for all three faiths is we're all looking for peace. And you can see that the uh, inside the, the dove's wings are the Hebrew uh, characters for shalom, which of course means uh, peace in Hebrew. And then down below, we can see here uh, this section, and that's about the Sabbath. We can see the, uh, the challah, or the bread uh, that is served at the Sabbath meal, along with a goblet of wine and two candlesticks that are uh, lit at the Sabbath. And this section is not just referencing the meal, but rather that whole, the, I guess, the, um, the idea of, of Sabbath, the, the need for us to take a, take a rest, to uh, recreate ourselves, to re rejuvenate our, our lives, and to really uh, think about the, the meaning our, our lives have. And, and the, that's something that Judaism has brought, brought through all three faiths. 
And this is the Christian window. And of course, the dominant symbol of Christianity is the cross. So we can see the, the cross there. And again, I like that idea of having it a little bit um, uh, slanted to, to give us some interesting shapes. And inside the cross, I've placed the, the, the positive images of the, of the faith. And I've tried to make those in lighter colors. So they, they are a little bit illuminated and they, and they come out a little more. Then outside the cross are some challenging things, uh, the challenging questions I had about Christianity. So for, for example, in this section here, you can see a, a blue figure um, cradling a pink figure, and that's referencing the parable of the Good Samaritan, which for me is, is, is more about just you know, being kind to people. But the, the Samaritan back in the days of Jesus when he told the, the parable was actually somebody who was, um, who was hated by the Jews. And so the irony is that this person who we thought was gonna be the enemy is actually the hero in the show, or the, 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 the parable. Um, and the other thing too about that is that um, people who pass the wounded traveler by are actually two religious people who are passing that person by because they become unclean by touching them. And so the parable is about, let's not hold our religiosity so tightly that we don't do the right thing. And I think we're all in danger of doing that. We think, well, I can do this or I can't do that. And we forget to, to help people when we can. Uh, in this section, this is outside the Star of David. And this is, I think, I think a challenge the Christian church has. It's about the marginalization, the marginalization of, of women. You can see a female form here reaching up to Christ, and Christ is on the cross there, but being pushed aside. And um, that's just a reference to the fact that women were a huge part of the early church and were moved out and marginalized. And you can also see some pink triangles in here too, and that's, um, that's uh, evoking uh, homosexuality and the fact that the same thing has happened to the, the homosexual community. And this is the Islamic window. And again, so the, the dominant symbols of Islam um, are the star. So you can see the star here and then the crescent. Uh, there's the big crescent around there. So again, I tried to place the positive images of the faith inside those, those, those uh, images or those shapes, and then the more challenging images outside. And a, a good example of how those relate to each other, down here at the very bottom, we've got um, this, this very bottom piece. You can see the, um, the word jihad. So these are the brush, brush strokes of the word jihad. And jihad, of course, it has been, we've been told in Western society that it's about making war, but it's actually about the struggle within yourself to do the right thing. And you can see that the, the brushstroke of jihad comes up here and into the next section, and then it turns into the, um, and is, um, a stylized version of the word uh, salam, which means peace. And it also looks a bit like a dove. So that's this idea of jihad and peace are actually linked. So the peace is inside the, there um, as a positive thing about the faith. And the jihad was one of those things that I was asking about, I was very challenged by, and it turned out that they were quite linked. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we're going for in that, in that section. So you've done around 50 performances across Canada, and now you're touring in Europe, and there's also been a documentary film made about The Knitting Pilgrim. So do you have plans to further expand on The Knitting Pilgrim? Yes, actually, we're about to release a podcast called The Knitting Pilgrim Talks. And one of the things that happens after every show is people say to us, we see all the images up there, but we wonder if, if you could explain to us what they mean. And that's what the podcast is going to do. So it's going to go through each section of each um, window. And I'm going to be talking to, uh, for the Judaic window, an, um, a rabbi or a scholar. Um, and for the Christian window, a minister or a, for a, an imam for the, um, uh, the Islamic window. And they're going to be, we're going to be talking, discussing the topic of that particular uh, section. And I've learned some fascinating things. I, for example, one of the sections in the Judaic window is asking the question about why women um, are sometimes excluded from certain rituals. And it, it turns out <laughs> the, the rabbi uh, I spoke to said, actually, the, the, they're not excluded from them, they're excused from them because they are busy 
caring for a family, and that's the most important thing. So doing some of these things that, that, we, that I understood that women weren't allowed to do, she said, no, no, it's not that they're not allowed to do it, it's just they don't have to do it because they have a family to raise. So that was a, a, a really eye-opening uh, experience for me. Um, and in the Christian window, I, one of the biggest questions I had was about this idea about a Christian soldier, because for me that doesn't really line up. Um, you know, the, being a soldier is about as far away from Jesus Christ as you can possibly get, in my thought. And and the, the minister I talked to said, his question was, yes, you know, Jesus was definitely a pacifist, but does that mean that, that we need to be pacifists all the time as well? And also, just this idea of the way Christianity grew is that it went into societies that were warlike societies, and it, it sort of subsumed that culture. So it, it took that that culture into it, and it grew through that. And so that was a, a really great thing. And then I think one of the biggest ones for the Islamic um, sections was this idea about jihad. In Western media, we hear jihad as being a bad, evil, warlike thing. But in fact, um, for Islam, jihad is really the, the struggle to do the right thing. And it's an it's an internal thing, and, and it's a personal jihad. It's it's what you're, you're you're trying to do what is right, and that is actually something that um, I worked into the um, the window, and it actually leads into the, the the next section, which is about peace, because uh, true jihad leads to peace, not to conflict. So those are some of the things that I I learned and were okay, really fascinating. Okay, they sound like they will be very interesting talks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when do yeah. you think that's going to come out? Um, it's going to be out in the next couple of weeks. This is when I get back from, uh, from this tour. We're going, to, we're going to get that out there as soon as okay, possible. Okay, yeah. great. And also with your wife, you've written another knitting-related play called mm -hmm. Spycraft, which is set in World War II France. Yes. So in a nutshell, what's the play about, and can you tell us a bit of history behind the story? Well, it actually came from the research of The Knitting Pilgrim, where we discovered that knitting in the past has been used uh, as espionage. Um, uh, often, it, it, a couple of different ways, it, most often it was just from women sitting around knitting and being invisible because, you know, who cares if there's an old lady over there knitting? It does, she doesn't matter. And of course, she could listen into things and then pass all the, that information. And also, in the World War II, apparently, um, there were some Belgian knitters who knit code into socks while they spied on Nazi troop movements, and they gave that information to the resistance. And we thought, that's a great idea for a show. And so we looked for source material. We looked for the knitting that had code in it, and we couldn't really find it. Uh, we're still looking, so if anybody knows of some, <laughs> by all means get in touch with us. But we didn't want to let that get in the way of a story, and so we created a character um, who uh, worked on a number of levels, who was a, a woman in her 50s, um, and uh, she was she worked, this, this character we created, she works for the, um, the English uh, spy or organization called the Special Operations Executive, and she's in Nazi-occupied um, France, and she is moving her code through knitting. She, and she's a speed knitter, obviously. She, yes, <laughs> she's, she's pretty quick, very, very clever. And she's also a hidden Jew. And so that adds some jeopardy to it. And she, she basically, um, she subverts the, uh, the chauvinism and the anti-Semitism of the time to succeed in this really unorthodox uh, way that is um, uh, classically female. It's a knitting scene as that. So it works really well. That sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. So that'll be exciting to, to see. And when do you think that's going to come into fruition? We are um, present, presently producing it and getting ready to go. And we, we hope to have it up in the fall of 2024. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we better end the interview here because in a couple of hours you have to perform here and you do need a bit of a break and a, something to eat. So thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing your work on Fruity Knitting. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye-bye.